the lamb. Yes. We're going to talk about the lamb of God this morning. You know, we are, uh, we, this morning we're celebrating the triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem, Jesus Christ. It was four days before his crucifixion. And it's, a, it's an interesting uh, celebration that the, the Jewish people had uh, leading up to uh, the Passover lamb being, uh, cruci- or being uh, slaughtered for the sins of the people. So this morning we're going to just a, a short teaching on what uh, this is all about. And we're going to talk a little bit about tradition. How many have traditions around Easter? You have traditions that you, you follow? You know, maybe family meals, uh, you know, people do um, hunt Easter eggs, and, uh, you know, I always point out to people it has absolutely nothing to do with the, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and actually it goes back to pagan worship. Now, th- am I saying that you're going to go to hell because you hide an egg and find it? No, but make sure you teach your children what this time is all about. That it has nothing to do with Easter bunnies, it has nothing to do with eggs, it, 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 but use the right traditions. Teach our, your children based on the biblical tradition. So as, as we uh, talk about these things, uh, I just think it's really important. I think we all have family traditions or different kinds of traditions that we have. Uh, you know, the services that we have here at Bethel, are, they're a tradition that we have uh, and that we follow. There's a lot of traditions this time of year. And one of the traditions that I'm particularly fond of is candy is something that's really important during this time of year. And, uh, you know, I've told people this before that I like peeps. Now, I want you all to please... Uh, you, you do not have to buy me peeps. I, I appreciate it. I get, I get a bunch of peeps this time of year because I talk about this. But I, want you, uh, I do want you to understand I appreciate them. And, man, people have gotten me some really good, the different flavors out there now. You don't have to just eat that, the vanilla ones, the, the blueberry and uh, cotton candy. Somebody even got me some cinnamon. Uh, you know, there's just all kinds of good peeps out there, but uh, candy is important, you know, candy. That's one of the traditions that I really like this time of year, and it's a pretty strong tradition because $1.9 billion are spent this time of year on candy, so that, that's a pretty strong tradition at, at this time of year, and some believe the celebration of Easter uh, uh, or Resurrection Sunday is a celebration of all good things. And uh, so, and candy is pretty good. So I think it's a good celebration. Lent is also a religious uh, tradition during this time of year. And, um, and I want you to understand, it is, it's a religious tradition. It's not really a biblical, although there are biblical things about it, but it is a religious tradition. In Western Christianity, uh, Easter marks the ending of Lent, or Resurrection Sunday. A 40-day period uh, of fasting, or repentance, uh, moderation, spiritual discipline in preparation for Resurrection Sunday. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. that that's awesome. Um, and if you observe Lent, that, that's fine. It's not necessarily a tradition that we follow here at Bethel, but there's nothing wrong with it. Observing, uh, observing Lent it can be a very good tradition, uh, but as you do it, make sure you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Do not think that you're fulfilling God's word by observing Lent. Uh, you can uh, fulfill the, the teachings of the Bible by doing these things that uh, take, that uh, happen during Lent, but there's also things that have become tradition that have nothing to do with the Bible. Uh, Ash Wednesday is, is one of those things uh, where people line up and get ashes put on. I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm not going to talk much about it, uh, but I just know that that's, you know, it's nothing to do with the Bible. 
Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders uh, of his day for replacing a relationship with God with man-made traditions. And that's what we have to be very careful of, that we do not replace the, the things of God and our relationship with, with Almighty God through his son, Jesus Christ, just with our tradition, uh, our daily traditions, our yearly traditions. Listen, coming to church can just be a tradition if we're not careful. It'll just become a traditional uh, thing that our family does every Sunday. And the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes it, it, it wanes or at times, it, sometimes it's non-existent for some people. I can tell you of people that went to church all their life and never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior until later on in life. Part of that was the church's fault for not telling them that Jesus is the Savior and that you need to receive Christ as your personal Savior, that he died for you. We, may, we do our very best to make sure everybody knows that. Jesus is the Lord. He is God's son who came to take away the sins of the world. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you will be saved. Jesus called these religious people hypocrites. And then he took from Isaiah 29, 13, this scripture. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see, if we allow the organized church to lead us down a road of believing in the commandments of men rather than the commandments of our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will stray. We'll get off track. Tr tradition causes this to happen sometimes. People get caught up in tradition. I found this little thing in regards to uh, churches and traditions in churches. Um, and it's about denominations and different religious beliefs. And uh, it has to do with the different traditions that uh, churches have in regarding to changing a light bulb. So, how many people does it take to change a light bulb in a Baptist church? At 15. At least 15. One to change your light bulb and three committees to approve the change. Presbyterians, none. Lights will go on and off as predestined times. They believe in predestination. Roman Catholic, none. Candles only. Charismatics and Pentecostals, 10. One to change the bulb and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. Episcopalians, two. One to call the electrician, two to mix the drinks. <laughs> Mormons, we're getting into a whole different sect here. Five, one man to change the bulb and four wives to tell him how to do it. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Methodist, undetermined, whether your light is bright, dull, or completely out, you are still loved. You can be a light bulb, a turn up bulb, or a uh, tulip bob. And sad to say, that seems to be the direction the Catholic or the Methodist Church is going. Not all of them. I don't, I don't want to put a label on all of them because many of them are fighting for traditional biblical principles. Lutherans, none. Lutherans don't believe in change. Established Bible te teaching church that is over 20 years old. And we have to... We, need to fight against this. One, it takes 10 people, one to actually change the bulb and nine to say how much they like the old one. That's what tradition will do to us uh, if we allow it. 
So it's very important that we do not allow ourselves to be caught up in tradition. Many of the traditions that we have during this time of year are good traditions. The Seder that we recognize, the um, for Good Friday service, the celebration that we always have on, on Resurrection Sunday. These are great, awesome, awesome traditions. But I want to encourage each and every one of you in your households, if you have children or grandchildren, make sure that you establish biblical traditions in your house. Prayer times, uh, praying at your meals, uh, praying with your children before they, they go to bed, uh, teaching them Bible stories, um, you know, all kinds of different biblical traditions that need to be established. We have all kinds of traditions that are non-biblical in our families. But we need to make sure that we have the right ones. There was a, a, a rabbi who was flying with his family. Well, the story is that he was on a, a, a train, actually. And he was traveling across country with his family. And he was seated next to an atheist. And he and the atheist started having a conversation. And they were talking about the different traditions that they had in their, their families. And, uh, you know, of course, the atheist didn't believe in God. The rabbi, uh, from a Jewish perspective, had a deep belief in God and taught his children and his grandchildren about uh, the living God, Yahweh. And as they had, a, had their discussion, they were talking back and forth, the rabbis, children and grandchildren kept coming up to him and saying, Papa, do you need anything? Do you, can I do anything for you? And, and the, the atheist was just amazed, and he, he finally said, my goodness, your, your children, your grandchildren, they show such respect and love for you. Why? My children could care less whether I even live or not. And rabbi said, well, it has to do with tradition. You say, in our family, our tradition is that I'm just one step closer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the living God, our creator. And in your tradition, you're just one step closer to an ape. Think about that. Isn't that the truth? So your traditions are very important. Let's make sure we're not allowing our traditions to replace relationship. First thing I want to share with you this morning is watch the lamb. John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River. In John chapter 1 verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the lamb. Behold means to look at or watch, watch closely. Uh, I think it was Ray Boltz a few years ago had a, a song, Watch the Lamb. And it was, it was a, a very moving song. And a man who was uh, present when Jesus was crucified and he had a lamb and he and his children, he told his children to watch the lamb. Of course, in the end, he told his children to watch the lamb of God on the cross, Jesus. As soon as God revealed to John that Jesus was the Lamb of God, uh, that he was the Messiah, he said, behold, this is the Lamb of God. And what he was saying to the Jewish people, and all of them understood that this is the person that is coming to take away your sins. And all every year as we celebrate Passover, we... It was pointing to this person, the Lamb of God, that was going to take away our sins. Many people didn't understand why, Jesus, why John called him the Lamb of God until they started putting, the, putting it all in perspective. And why it was so important to watch the Lamb. But once Jesus fulfilled his mission, even his disciples began to realize that Jesus truly was the Lamb of God. He died, he bled, but he came back to life. He defeated death and hell. Because they had been participating all their life in a feast called the Passover. 
Now, the Passover is actually, uh, it's a combination of three feasts. The Jewish people refer to it as Passover, but it's actually Passover, first fruits, and unleavened bread, it's, which is a week-long celebration. Many in the body of Christ over the years didn't even realize why John said, Behold the Lamb of God, because we have lost the traditional teachings uh, of our roots, the, and our roots are Jewish. Now, a lot of people would say, who believe in replacement theology, ah, oh, we can do away with all that, that Jewish stuff. Well, the reality is, we learn and grow from the Jewish people, and God has called the Jewish people to be a light to the whole world. Now, they missed the mark. They rejected their Savior, and now it's the church's responsibility, but we didn't replace the Jewish nation. We are the body of Christ. God is working with the Jews in a different way than he's working with the body of Christ. He's commanded us to preach the gospel even to the Jews. That they will come to the saving grace of their Messiah, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But there's many appointed feasts. And they're Jewish, they're referred to as the Jewish Moedim, or translated the feasts of the Lord. Now they're not Jewish feasts, they're the Lord's feasts. The Lord established God established these feasts. These feasts, these appointed feasts, are prophetic markers in God's timetable throughout history. Jesus came, and as he preached and taught the word of God, during Passover, he died as the Lamb of God. He was buried. He was resurrected on first fruits. And he walked on the face of the earth as the uh, bread of life. So he fulfilled those, those three spring feasts. So in the word of God, now here's what I want us to all to understand. We look at these feasts, we talk about these feasts, we sometimes celebrate these feasts, but there is not a biblical mandate for us to celebrate them like it was for the Jews, or it is still for the Jews. We are not ordered, commanded by Scripture. But they are so important to our heritage for us to understand them, particularly during this time of year. So that's why it's very important that we understand from a biblical perspective how we're supposed to relate to these feasts. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul gives us he teaches the Gentiles, and he's teaching all of us, how we are to relate to the Jewish Moedim, or the Jewish feast. Let no man, he says in verse 16 and 17, let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, or of a new moon, or of a Sabbath day, which are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Paul is saying, listen, you're not judged based on these things, whether you celebrate them or not. But he made it perfectly clear that they are tools for us to learn and grow by. He believes, uh, Paul believed that those Jewish Moedims pointed to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that the, the fall feasts are pointing to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can't put a date, a day, a time on it. But I believe that's, it's going to happen during that, that time of year in the fall. God never intended for his people to reject those Moedims, so the, the feasts of the Lord. So that's why here at Bethel we do, do our best to try to just teach from them. There are seven feasts that God gave to Israel. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and a feast uh, which is first fruits is a feast of weeks. And these are all the spring feasts. And then there's fall feasts, trumpets, day of atonement, great day of atonement, so what it's referred to, and tabernacles. These are all the fall feasts. And of course, Passover is the, the celebration of the deliverance of the Jewish people from uh, the hands of the Egyptians, the cruel bondage that they were in, and slavery in Egypt. Every year around this time, devout Jews celebrate Passover. They prepare for it, they celebrate it, 
They do the Haggadah, the telling of the story of the, the exodus from Egypt. Now, for the most part, the Jewish nation has rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Now, there are born again, messy, they, we refer to them as Messianic Jews. They are Jewish people who have received Christ as their personal Savior. And there's, uh, there's a growing number of those Jewish people. Uh, if you know uh, of any uh, rabbis uh, that are Christians, you've probably uh, heard of uh, rabbis teaching. You've seen some different rabbis on TV. Jonathan Kahn is one. He's, he's of Jewish descent, and he has a Christian church. Uh, he's, it, but he teaches uh, many things from the Jewish perspective. Jesus sat down with his disciples and uh, just before his crucifixion and he made it clear that he was about to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, which was this Passover. In Jesus' time and because the temple was there, there were three major feasts that the Jews had to, uh, Jewish men had to attend. And of course, they normally took their families. It was Passover. They refer to it as Peshach. Shavuot, Pentecost, and a Feast of Weeks, Tabernacles. Uh, that's a fall feast. These are three feasts that were required. That's why there were so many people in Jerusalem during Passover and during the time of Jesus' uh, crucifixion. Because they were there to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. God required them to be there. Because he had an appointed time. It was an appointment that he had for the whole world. But particularly for the Jewish nation. That Jesus Christ was going to die on Passover to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. This is very important from, from a biblical perspective for us to understand this. God didn't just randomly say, oh, Jesus, go down there and, you know, die whenever. It doesn't make any sense. God had this plan from the very beginning. And Jesus came and fulfilled it. And he's going to fulfill the fall feasts as well. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word rendered dwelt here literally means tabernacled. He came and dwelt with us. He tabernacled with us. And, of course, one of those feasts is tabernacles. There are four major elements in the Passover. And we will be using these elements during our Passover celebration. Uh, the lamb, which was to be roasted and eaten. By the way, you know, Tammy already mentioned this, we will not be eating a full meal. We would just be making reference to all these things. But we will be taking certain items that are referenced in the uh, Passover celebration to help us to understand each year exactly how the Jewish people celebrated this. Uh, matzah, which is unleavened bread, and you pro most everyone's probably seen matzah crackers. They're... Uh, they look like they have stripes on them and they're uh, just an unleavened cracker that we use at this time of year. And um, maror, which is the bitter herbs. And of course, wine uh, is used. We will be using grape juice, so don't freak out on me. Uh, and the reason we do that, okay, it, would there be anything wrong with us doing, uh, you know, using wine? Probably not. Uh, some churches do. But the reason that, that we abstain from using wine at, at any time is because we have people who are recovering from alcoholism. And we don't want to put a stumbling block of any kind in front of, of anyone. So it is extremely important that we understand that uh, the, some of the things that traditionally in church, in, in our type of church, uh, congregations people 
you know, abstain from alcohol. We do that for our brothers and sisters. That's why we do it. You know, if you've dealt with alcoholism, you know how easy it is for somebody to get back. Drug addiction is the same thing. You know, how how easy the enemy can lead those people back into that addiction. So we want to protect people from that. There's four cups that we'll be taking on, uh, during our Seder service. Sanctification, judgment, redemption, and praise. And during the redemption cup of wine, right before that, that's when Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. And then he took the wine and said, this is my blood that is shed for, the, uh, for redemption. During that Seder, he fulfilled what the Scripture said, the righteous requirements of the law. And then he went to the cross for all of us. As we can see, the perfect Lamb of God always, has always been God's design for redemption. It's awesome. God is a redeeming God. And I want, I want everyone to understand something. I don't care what your life has been like. I don't care how far you've strayed from God. He's calling you into his kingdom. You may have, maybe you've known the Lord in the past and you've turned from that. Maybe you've never known the Lord. You may be watching this. You've never known Christ. You've never, you've never realized that he died on the cross for your sins that he came back to life for you. And all you have to do is repent and receive Christ as your personal savior. I offer you salvation in Jesus Christ this morning. And I call you back, those who have strayed, I call you back into the kingdom because God loves you so much. He will not, he does not want you to perish and he will chase you down to bring you back into his kingdom. The second thing, and this is my last point this morning, who is this? And I take this from the scripture. Matthew 21, 8, 9, and 10. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Of course, we're talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem four days before uh, he is going to be crucified on the cross. He's coming in. And we call this the triumphal entry. It was a time that the the Jewish people uh, had set aside to choose a lamb without spot or blemish. The the, uh, Sanhedrin, the the priest, would go choose a lamb. And the people all chose lambs for themselves. And they were to take that lamb. The people were to take that lamb into their house for four days. And love it. And treat it like a friend and then it had to be sacrificed for their sins how difficult that must have been if you're an animal lover at all how difficult it must have been for children to to have that little lamb in their their house a year old lamb but that's that's the image God wants us to have that his son came His son walked on the face of his son, came into Jerusalem and was accepted as as the Messiah. And then four days later, they turned their back on him. They killed him. Then the multitudes who went before those who followed cried out saying, this is during the, the triumphal entry. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna Hosanna means save now. So this was a a traditional Jewish uh, epitaph toward the Messiah. They were uh, crying out, Hosanna, save now. Send your Messiah, God. It came to be known as a standard messianic cry. The reality was that most of the people didn't even realize what was taking place. 
Because in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, it says, And we had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Who is this? They were crying out. They were calling him the Messiah. They were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And yet, most of them said, Who is this? It's so important that we know who it is. So important that we understand that this is the Messiah, the one who came, who died, who took away the sins of the world. John had answered that question when he first saw Jesus. He said, when he saw Jesus coming, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, when Christ, when Jesus asked him, who do you think I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the revelation that each and every one of us has to have. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. For centuries, the, the Jewish people had been a, expecting the ancient scriptures to be fulfilled that the Messiah was going to the Mashiach was going to come but when he came when he arrived because of their many traditions they didn't recognize him many people don't recognize Jesus today we really miss him we miss who he is and what he's really like We've heard stories. We've had other people tell us what Jesus is, is like, but you're not going to know Jesus until you know him personally. That's the only way. Every year on the 10th of Abib, the high priest, as a spiritual leader of Jerusalem, would leave Jerusalem. The priests would all line up, and he would walk through this corridor, a priest. He'd leave Jerusalem and go out to Bethlehem. He would go to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is where the Passover lambs were raised, outside of Bethlehem. Those Passover lambs were raised specifically for sacrifice, and they had to be without spot and blemish. So they would set aside those that were perfect. They would set them aside. They would put them in a special place and wrap their legs with cloth, swaddling clothes and protect their legs so that there would be no spot or blemish on those lamps. And the pass and the priest would go out to Jerusalem or out to Bethlehem and choose one that was absolutely perfect and bring it back. Jesus Christ was absolutely perfect in all his ways, without sin, without mark, without blemish. That's why he could die as the Lamb of God for us. When he came back, all the priests, the high priest came back, all those priests that were lined up, corridors, they would see him coming and they would begin the shouts, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And as they began to shout, there was multitude of people, 150 to 200,000 people in Jerusalem during this period of time to celebrate Passover. And they would pour out of their uh, houses and out of the places that they were staying. There, and they'd grab uh, palm fronds and uh, different things that they waved and lay their clothes out and and they would uh, present them, uh, themselves as worshipers to the Messiah because they were expecting him to come. But every year they went through this tradition, tradition, tradition. Every year the same thing. So when Jesus came and they, they saw him, they said, who is this? They didn't really know. They were hailing him as the Messiah. But they didn't know that he was really the Messiah. And as he entered in, he entered in 10 days, exactly fulfilling the law, ten day, or on the 10th, I'm sorry, four days before 
the Passover. He entered in, and guess what? They accepted him just like the, um, the high priest would go and accept the lamb that was spot, without spot or blemish. And then the high priest would take him, and for four days he would inspect that lamb to make absolutely sure he was without spot or blemish. Jesus walked through the streets of, of Jerusalem for those four days, showing himself to be perfect in all his ways. They could find no fault in him. Even, Pilate said, when he was ready to, to turn him over to the Jews to be crucified, he said, I find no fault in this man. He was perfect. As we can see, this is leading up. Tenth of Abib, coming into Jerusalem, leading up to the feast, the Passover, the unleavened bread, and the first fruits. Surely, surely, the world, if they would just take a look at the reality of what was fulfilled by Jesus, that they could see that Jesus truly is that Lamb of God the King of kings, the Lord of lords. As they hailed him, they hailed him as Messiah. In four days, those same people were going to be crying, crucify him, crucify him. You see, if we live on tradition, we can change on a whim. But if we have relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we will always, always have the assurance that we have our Savior, our Lord and Savior in our life and that he will lead and direct and keep us through whatever comes in our life. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's our cry. And you know our cry now is, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We all have families, loved ones, and we don't want to leave them. But I can tell you this, when Jesus Christ comes... There's not, there will be nothing that we can compare it to. Our life, eternal life with the Lord. But it is so important that we understand that what Jesus said. John chapter 8 verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's who he is. He's the light. He's the lamb. He's the door. He's the resurrection. He is the only way. That's what he said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. There's no other way. No one else you can put your faith in. No other religion. Nothing. Jesus is the only way. In his book, Not a Fan, Kyle Ottoman said, Jesus was never interested in having fans. He had fans on, that, on the day that he entered into Jerusalem. They were his fans. When he defines what kind of relationship he wants, enthusiastic admirers isn't an option. My concern is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Jesus Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not close enough to fulfill his requirements. Stand with me.
This week we're going to be celebrating some of the things that, that we're, we will be doing. Some of the services will be uh, more solemn than others. The, the Wednesday night service is a, a telling uh, and it uh, is more of a laid back family time, fa family atmosphere. Um, I always enjoy the, the Seder service. And Friday night will be a very solemn service. And then, of course, Sunday morning we'll come in excited about the resurrection of our Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will, we will celebrate on Sunday morning. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Thank you for following us. Uh, and uh, if you're watching us online, we appreciate it. Remember, love never fails. Heavenly Father, we're 